Assistant Assembly. Public session. Uh, quick test. Philip, Gemma, Melissa, can you hear us? Could somebody uh, say something so we can hear you? Commission, Shaw, Melissa. They'd be, they'd, be, um, they'd be brought into the spotlight, Chair, if, uh, if you want to ask Assembly Broadcasting to bring the members into the spotlight. Uh, yes, could uh, the ah. Assembly Broadcasting bring the members of our committee into the spotlight, please? <laughs> And possibly I can unmute. Yeah, can you do it from here? I think we're in the air, are we? Yes, well done, Philip. Excellent. So, sorry about that, but I, I didn't want to proceed much further unless you had the opportunity to give us your pearls of wisdom as we go through. <laughs> and, indeed, and just, you met this uh, uh, great singing. We sang a great song there whenever you couldn't hear. It was, it was beautiful. But. <laughs> uh, uh, but first of all, uh, I've Nothing got seditious. Yeah. Uh, but first, before that, I think I've got some uh, uh, unfortunate news. But I wish to inform you that uh, Peter, who's uh, the normal clerk, is unable to attend today due to family bereavement. And I think all of us in the committee would wish to send on our condolences to Peter's wider family. And indeed, I understand it affects other members of the uh, staff of the assembly as well. So, if with your permission, uh, committee, I would like to would like to pass that on. If we're agreed. 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 Okay, if we move on to apologies, no apologies have been received. Um, and I understand, Philip, you've sent, a, uh, sent me a note saying that, uh, is it Gemma will have your uh, voting? Melissa? Melissa. Right. Melissa. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Uh, declaration of interest remind members they're obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interest at each committee meeting as applicable. I wish to declare an interest. There is an item of correspondence at 10.14 that refers to ARC 21. You may or may not be aware that I am uh, prominently against ARC 21's decision to build a Ponzi scheme incinerator on top of the High Town Road. And I've been quite vociferous about some time, but I wanted to declare my interest, so there was no, uh, there was no uh, issue when we came to that point at 10.14. Sorry, Chair, I should just clarify that um, uh, Pat Catney is joining by Australia. I don't know if he's officially joined yet, but he, because he may be off for part of it for a meeting, uh, I'm, I have his vote if it's relevant. Yeah, if you could just, just send it, just for the yeah. record system, could you send it in an email uh, between Pat and you and to Jim, so Jim's, Jim's actually got it. Yeah. Okay. If we move on to the next item of business number, item number three, Chairperson's Business. Uh, first item, Ministerial written, written Statement, Further Allocations. My members that the Minister has provided a written statement at page four of tabled items setting a further resource allocation of over $100 million for measures including housing executive maintenance, student hardship, financial resilience for transit and teachers' pay. In terms of the latter, it would appear that the pay settlement applies to the current financial year, but is not clear whether this has actually been agreed and is therefore, is therefore in this allocation. And though it is welcome, uh, the question is whether it, does, whether it complies with the Treasury rules is not as discussed in questions put by the Deputy Chairperson last week. Um, can I have your agreement to write to the Department of Finance seeking clarity in this allocation and its compliance with Treasury rules, given it is understood that the settlement has not yet been formally agreed? And we have not seen anything from the Minister. I know he is trying to get uh, information from the Treasury, but I, do not, I have not been informed of anything that agreement has been made for carry forward. Are we agreed? Agreed. And, sorry. Oh my God, uh, next item in the agenda 3.2, Presbyterian Mutual Society. I advise members that you that have received correspondence from concerned savers from the Pres Presbyterian Mutual Society who are seeking assurance from the insolvency practitioner that losses to savings will be made good. Uh, sorry, Mr Chairman, this is a ghost from the past. Um, I, my understanding was that the PMS issue had been totally sorted out as a result of a £200 million loan that DFP obtained to pay back the churches and the individuals. So I got some of that correspondence as well. A bit shocked. I mean, surely this is all yeah. put to bed. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure whether it's within this department, uh, within this committee's purview either. Whether it is, it is because I was on, I was oh. on the committee when, oh, sometime before the Boer War when this came up. Um, <laughs> the, the church has got 90% back 
um, and the individuals got a similar figure. And then my understanding was that eventually it would all be paid back. We took a £200 million loan. Actually, had we held on to the property, we would now be in profit, which was ironical that the Assembly actually held on to it. So that was the case 2013. And I've heard nothing since, and there's a lot of PMS investors in South Down. I've heard absolutely nothing since, and then suddenly out of nowhere, the letters start to arrive again. Um, I, I just, unless the issue is that they didn't get interest on the repayments, mm. that might be the issue. That's the only thing I can think of. Yeah. Well, sort of, we've received in the January monitoring round there was a bid from the Presbyterian Mutual, the, a bid for the Presbyterian Mutual Society expected credit loss as a tongue twister of 18.5 million was reported as being met by HM Treasury and PMS Capital receipts. Reduced requirement of 7.8 million is also reported by the Department for the Economy. Um, look, I think I'm content to write to the Minister for Economy seeking clarity on the credit loss issue and the current position in respect of the Presbyterian Mutual Society. But I think this is, um, I think this is uh, an area that I would like to hand over to the Department of the Economy to have a look at, just to get that if we're agreed. Okay. Agreed. Thank you. Sorry, Chair, do you mean the Committee of the Economy? Or no, the, the Minister for the Economy. Minister. Yeah. Okay. And I think they, and then if they see where it goes, goes from there. Uh, advise, programme for Government, advise members that the Executive has launched a consultation on a new programme for Government. The Department of Finance is mentioned in the consultation, consultation document as being involved with particular outcomes through supporting work, including transform, transformation in education, transformation of health, transformation of the PSNI, changes at the housing executive, which are designed to tackle homelessness and a role in promoting economic growth of possibly supporting the digital economy. Um, could we seek agreement to write to the Department asking for clarification as to its role in supporting the PFG outcomes, bearing in mind we are in the consultation period? Are we content? And if we are agreed, say agreed. Great. Uh, House of Lords European Select Committee advise members that the House of Lords EU Select Committee has invited chairpersons of statutory committees at the Assembly to attend a meeting on the 23rd of February in order to discuss matters relating to the Northern Ireland Protocol. I seek for your uh, agreement for, for me to attend this meeting as chairperson and to feedback findings of any to the Committee for Finance thereafter. Are we content and agreed? Agreed. agreed. Draft minutes of proceedings on the 27th of January. Four members at the revised draft minutes of the meeting on the 27th of January are tabled at items at page 13. The clerk advises that two amendments are shown in red and indicate that the committee agreed that two items of correspondence to the minister would be subject to confirmation by correspondence. Ask members if they content the draft minutes are an accurate record of the proceedings subject to these amendments. If we are, so may we say agreed? Agreed. The minutes will be published on the website. That's going to be like Pat coming in. No, still not no. Okay. Um, matters arising. I remind the members that the committee agreed to write to the minister with regards to review by the OECD of the executive's implementation of previous OECD recommendations in respect to the public sector. Uh, advise members that agreement of the wording that was not achieved through correspondence. The draft letter is at page 20. I understand, uh, Philip, Melissa, or Gemma, would one of you want to talk to the reason why uh, you weren't content with us to put the, put the letter through? Yes, uh, I can attest that uh, one. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the last paragraph that I wasn't content, the second last paragraph, I think it is, that I wasn't content, but uh, I don't think that it's the uh, position of the person from OECD and the likes of to make an adjustment on uh, the arrangement that exists as a result of our unique situation, i.e. where we have um, uh, five parties involved in um, uh, the coalition government as such, and uh, that uh, it's, you know, it would be totally wrong of us to be asking or expecting that type of judgment to be made one way or the other. And I think that by including that paragraph, um, I would question the very motives for having it in there. Yeah, I, I agree, Chair. I don't think it's. That, I mean, I'm happy with it. Uh, other than that uh, particular paragraph, which is the one, two, paragraph. three, four. I, I think it's basically, we're asking the OECD to provide a commentary on our constitutional arrangements, and I don't think that would be. Um, I don't think it would be appropriate. I'm not sure they would even want, want to do it. Okay. Other thoughts, Chair? Sure, could I make a comment? Yep. I think this arose from a couple of questions I asked the gentleman last week. 
where it was clear that uh, I asked about opposition and then about the system of government. And uh, it was clear that uh, the comments made in 2016 were made with no regard to that context. Whereas if this is about improving and accountability of government, surely if the system of government has a bearing on that, it would be only but appropriate that OECD uh, should be invited, if they have any comment to make about that, to make it. Okay. Um, if the paragraph, one, sorry, Deputy Chair, do you want to make a comment? Oh. No, no, sorry. Okay. Uh, the main thrust of this was the aspect of the, the evidence that we received from OECD, and I think just judging by the committee response, we were surprised that OECD hadn't been asked to look back at the overall changes in public sector and sort of the changes that were being put in. The question that obviously was germane um, and was raised by uh, Jim Allister was the question of whether the whole system of government here was suitable in accordance with what the OECD was doing. I think the intent of the committee uh, was to ask the question of the OECD coming in and looking at the reforms that had been made specifically on public sector reforms to achieve that aim and goal. Now, to receive, and I would rather this went with the consensus of the committee, but if we removed paragraph four, I think we still get to the point of getting the OECD to look at, mark the homework, bearing in mind they were in the first place to uh, set it up and make the recommendations in the first place if we were <coughs> content. Yeah, I would uh, second that proposal. Okay. Uh, Pat, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, wait. Good. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that would make sense. I mean, I just think there's a, there's a, 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 lo a logical point. I, I understand people have uh, views on our system of government. Lots of people have views on our, we all, most of us in this committee have views on our constitutional arrangements. And the issue of this space obviously is that you, uh, is that you can um, it, it's a great deal of difficulty where you start the where you start the study where you st so I think um, uh, I also think it's appropriate given that you the original suggestion that you made chair was to do a benchmarking or update study on what they had done before logically it made sense for that and it's, a, and it's obviously a more, a more narrow and a bit of work I think to be honest if we were to commission the, commission the OECD to tell us whether our institutions were completely fit for a purpose. It would take them a hell of a long time to go away and do that work because they'd need to spend quite a lot of time uh, going through, um, uh, you know, various different um, consultations and, and historical uh, analyses. So I think much better for them simply to update what they did a few years ago, or to, to test how well we've done because there are real questions there about whether those have been actions that I think are pertinent to the okay. how well we're performing. So the proposal I have put is that we submit the uh, we sub submit the correspondence with that uh, paragraph deleted. I have uh, I have raised the issue. It's been seconded. Uh, well, Chair, I just want to record. I totally disagree with that. Some people must be fearful of what an OECD might say. I'm quite prepared to take the risk if they come back and say this is the most wonderful, fantastic uh, system of government. I'll take that risk. Uh, but obviously, others aren't prepared to take well, that risk. Chair, I, I might just uh, sorry, through, through the chair. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I may, Chair, and for, and for the sake of, uh, of responding in kind to, to what Jim just said, We've spent a lot of time in the past few weeks and months debating about whether Jim's bill that's just been passed was an attempt to uh, undermine our system of government. It may not have been, but this definitely is. <laughs> so, um, uh, I, wh while understanding there are very strong views on it and there are real academic and uh, uh, analytical questions about it, I don't think this, uh, the OECD are the appropriate channel for analysing it. Okay. Look, uh, look team. Um, I'm more than happy for the correspondence to go forward with that, that paragraph in it. I think that gets the original intent we have. Jim, uh, I'm happy to put it to a vote if you want, but... Well, I want to record my dissent from it. Yeah, okay. Same, same here. Okay. Uh, well, you're quite happy for us to record, record no, your yourself. dissent in the minutes. Okay. Thank you. And if now we move into private session... And the next item on the agenda is Building Control NI proposed amendments to building regulations. 
Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to bring the following witnesses to spotlight, please? Uh, Tom Lavery, uh, Martin McCook, Sean McConville and Al Mars, please. Tom, Martin, Sean and Alan, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Okay. Yeah. I, I apologise for what, what might sound to be a sort of a slightly dodgy links going back and forth and the rest of it, but uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I want to remind members that the recession has been recorded by Hansard and inform members that the following papers are relevant to this agenda item. Uh, the briefing, briefing note on building regulations on page 22, the building control NI paper on page 28. Raise its building regulation paper on the ban of combustible cladding materials, page 37. Ardro Ardroit e Economics Limited Survey Analysis, on page 48. And extracts from the departmental consultation on the proposed SR, the Building Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, page 81. Um, over to you, uh, gentlemen, please. And please uh, give us your opening statement and your evidence, please. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Madam Vice for this opportunity to provide a briefing to the committee today. Uh, my name is Tom Lowry. I'm the current chair of BCNI. Um, in addition to this oral briefing, we provide the committee with a written statement to further explain our position and provide views on the proposed changes to the building regulations and the civil guidance documents. By way of a background summary, uh, members will be aware that in Northern Ireland, the building regulations are written by the Building Standards Branch of the UF. Local councils through the building control departments are responsible for the enforcement of these regulations, and essentially that's through a process of checking plans and documentation, as well as inspecting construction works on site. In the early 90s, um, building regulations in Northern Ireland moved uh, almost exclusively away from prescriptive break requirements about how, to, uh, how buildings should be constructed to more functional requirements in relation to, to how it should perform. Now, Whilst prescriptive requirements um, certainly bring clarity to our role and make compliance easier to police, we fully acknowledge that this can also stifle innovation and product development, which uh, both are seen as major drivers towards uh, the move to performance-based standards. Under such a law, each council can act independently in relation to this enforcement role. However, uh, to ensure uniformity and consistency in interpretation, as well as the application and enforcement of the building regulations across New Ireland, the Heads of Building Control meet on a regular basis through the volunteer umbrella uh, known as Building Control Northern Ireland, or BCMI. There are a number of working panels of BCMI, one of which is the Fire Safety Panel. Our response to the consultation and our written statement to the committee today has been preferred by the Fire Safety Panel in conjunction with BCMI. Attended with me today are members of BCMI and the Fire Safety Panel, and at this point I would like to introduce Al Mars from the Fire Safety Panel who will further explain our position and the views on the proposed changes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Can, can everybody hear me okay? Uh, we can, Alan. Yep. Okay, Committee, there are five areas on which the consultation proposes change, and I will provide comments on behalf of Building Control Northern Ireland on each of these areas. Firstly, the new prescriptive regulation restricting the materials permitted on the external walls of relevant buildings over 18 metres. Building Control Northern Ireland consider the proposed restrictions for buildings over 18 metres to be the lower risk option for this specific category of building. This proposed new risk of compliance is based on limiting by law the materials that can be used on the external walls of a relevant building. For the purposes of this briefing, we will refer to this as the limited, or sorry, the non-combustible route to compliance. This new regulation for relevant buildings will prevent the use of the existing route to compliance, which we will refer to as the limited combustibility route, and also the use of large-scale system testing, which we will refer to as the testing route. So the proposed new requirement reduces the routes to compliance for relevant buildings over 18 metres to one mandatory approach. This is a relatively unique position in modern building regulations and especially in fire safety provision, which usually have flexibility in terms of how compliance with a functional regulation can be justified. The framing of the regulation in this manner will bring absolute clarity to how compliance must be achieved 
especially where work on a relevant building has commenced prior to plan approval. In relation to apartment buildings, this non-combustible approach further complements the stay-put philosophy embodied in the benchmark design standards for means of escape. It is important that we do acknowledge the disadvantage from an industry perspective with this new one-route only approach is that it leaves little scope for innovation, material selection or variation offered by the testing route. So secondly, the proposed changes for non-relevant buildings over 18 metres. There are two routes to compliance proposed for all other buildings over 18 metres. So we have the limited combustibility route and the testing route. These are not mandatory solutions, but are provided in guidance as the regulators agreed methods by which a designer or contractor can justify compliance with the functional regulations. However, different from the proposals for relevant buildings, there is no compulsion to follow one of these methods, and in that we see a slight weakness, which, which I will touch on shortly. We welcome the proposed changes in guidance for the route to compliance for non-relevant buildings over 18 metres, which is based on limiting the primary materials on the external walls to those which are deemed to be of limited combustibility. Current guidance in Northern Ireland extends restrictions only to the insulation materials and theoretically, theoretically does not prevent the use of highly flammable cladding materials known to have caused rapid fire spread on high-rise buildings across the world. Sorry, we sorry, also... Sorry, um, yes. Alan, could you say that again, please? You said it in Northern Ireland? Yeah. Yeah, the current fire safety guidance and technical booklet A only restricts requirements so the, 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 the government's a presumption of compliance would be achieved by restricting the insulation materials in buildings over 18 metres to those with their limited combustibility. It would not prevent the use of highly flammable cladding materials that have been used on buildings around the world that have caused rapid fire spread. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We, we also welcome the acknowledgement of large-scale fire testing as an alternative approach to compliance in this category of building. There should be comfort for the committee that following either of these two options to compliance would ensure the system retrofitted to Grenfell Tower could not be approved for use in any non-relevant building over 18 metres in Northern Ireland. We do, hope, we do have concerns, though, that the use of desktop study for product substitutions in the tested route will still be permitted, as will justifying compliance by other means, given the legal flexibility that comes with the options for non-relevant buildings. Whilst we understand the benefit of desktop study and the flexibility they bring, we are of the opinion there is sufficient scope for choice within the proposed two routes without further flexibility for desktop studies or indeed any other method of justification. We consider options for compliance should be restricted in non-relevant buildings over 18 metres by making the testing and limited combustibility routes the two sole mandatory options. Desktop studies rely on assumptions and opinion when what fire safety needs is assurance. If we look to provisions made for sound transfer between dwellings, where only the two solutions the legislator is sure works or has evidence they work are permitted, the question would have to be, why not for fire safety? So, number three, extending the proposed restrictions for relevant buildings to hotels. We have no strong opinion that the non-combustible route to compliance should be extended to hotels or any other non-relevant building. The fire safety design and means of escape philosophy in hotel is such that occupants are usually alerted to evacuate in the first instance of fire, and hotels are not usually designed, constructed and managed on the basis of occupants staying put or being subject to any progressive evacuation strategy, which is usually the case for the category of buildings subject to the non-combustible rule. External fire spread is still a key fire consideration for occupant life safety in hotels, However, there is arguably a higher standard needed for relevant building, especially in apartments, to ensure each individual apartment is maintained as a place of safety for a set period of time. There is clearly a need to ensure we never see again a situation of such unprecedented fire spread as occurred in Grenfell Tower in any type of building. However, in our opinion, as previously stated, 
based on evidence and information that has come out since the fire, the combination of unmodified polyethylene ACM and the primary form of insulation installed in the tower would not comply with either of the proposed routes to compliance, which would be applicable to hotels and other non-relevant buildings. As advised, we consider an improvement for all non-relevant buildings over 18 metres, including hotels, would be to make the proposed options mandatory, with no scope for justifying compliance by other means, including the use of desktop studies. So, uh, number four, the guidance provided for all other buildings under 18 metres. We consider the guidance from fire spread over the external walls for buildings under 18 metres to be insufficient, and this will lead to confusion across the industry. The proposed guidance clarifies for the first time that additional measures may be required in buildings under 18 metres, uh, 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 sorry, under eight, or over 18 metres, under 18 metres, and above the limited restrictions historically in place however, provides no routes to compliance or rules in this regard. So, so just to recap, through this consultation, the Department have established proposed mandatory rules for relevant buildings over 18 metres, for which industry must follow, and proposed guidance for non-relevant buildings over 18 metres, which industry may use to validate compliance. However, in our opinion, further work is needed to provide similar routes to compliance or other rules for buildings under 18 metres if these are deemed necessary, as this category covers the vast majority of buildings we deal with in Northern Ireland. Technical guidance provided by your department on external fire spread is unchanged since the early 1990s and has never contained any rules or restrictions for buildings under 18 metres other than restrictions on external surfaces. We can advise as well that no, on this basis, no specific additional measures with respect to external fire spread have been required by building controls across Northern Ireland in buildings lower than 18 metres since this time. So any new guidance needs to be clear and unambiguous and needs to consider routes to compliance for all buildings under 18 metres. Failure to be clear about what materials can and cannot be used on the external wall of a building under 18 metres will lead to inconsistencies from a design and enforcement perspective. Functional regulations rely on a detailed route to compliance or rules to achieve success, and the industry have not been provided with sufficient guidance in this regard for these buildings. Alan, would so be, last, sorry, Alan, yes. just, to, just to come in there. So it'd be Fair, fair to summarise that basically we should have the same rules and regulations for above and below 18 metres? No, not necessarily, because historically the fire safety rules um, considered were for buildings at height where firefighting was an issue. Um, I think more recently there have been fires in buildings uh, at a lower height, and specifically the Bolton fire, where the government seemed to, in England, get slightly spooked with that and issued a, a, a basically a diktat to say that there needed to be measures in place for buildings under 18 metres and that the functional regulation applied, but they provided no rules to compliance or no guidance on that. They've left it with the industry. Okay, thanks, Alan. Just lastly, and this is the last point, um, and then we can take questions. The height at which the higher restrictions for relevant buildings should apply. Unfortunately, we have no evidence to help inform the decision of the height at which the non combustible route for relevant buildings should apply. Whilst we understand the review of building regulations and fire safety in England did not conclude a ban on combustible materials was necessary, the ban was implemented in 2019 and is now being proposed in Northern Ireland. Importantly, this decision does not appear to have been based on fire science, but a conscious political decision to, be, to move to a more cautious mandatory approach, which, which is the prerogative of the legislator. The cutoff point for which the new regulation has been set in England has utilised the existing 18 metre height threshold, a decision which is under the same review as in our consultation, and in Scotland they have gone with 11 metres, however allowing for the alternative of testing. There is, however, no clear right, scientific... Just, 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 to, just to cut in there again. Why are the Scots yeah. going for 11 metres rather than 18? 
look, I, I don't know. I wasn't party to the decision. My understanding is they, ha they have had meetings at, at a legislator level um, and decided to go with 11 metres. I think it probably ties in with the requirements for sprinklers, which I'm going to come on to. So they have a requirement for sprinkler provision in buildings down to 11 metres. So the two, the two heights probably marry up to a degree. Okay, thanks. So there is, however, no clear scientific or research-based evidence to support any of these heights, and that is acknowledged by fire safety professionals and by the legislators. This debate needs to reflect on the fact that we're the only part of the UK which does not require sprinklers in domestic apartments for buildings of any height, when both Scotland and, Eng with both Scotland and England now requiring these for apartments over 11 metres. We acknowledge a line needs to be drawn somewhere, but in this regard, there could be no real evidence based to any decision on the threshold height at which this new regulation is implemented. Clearly, the proposal of 11 metres will extend the scope of the lower risk approach for relevant buildings and will help to further support the means of escape provisions for apartments and the stay put philosophy on which they are based. As previously stated, though, if there are now concerns around external fire spread on all buildings lower than 18 metres, we need clear rules and routes to compliance, not just a consideration of a ban on combustible materials for relevant buildings down to an agreed lower threshold height. So thank you for your time. Um, my colleagues and I would be happy to take any questions you have at this point. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Uh, we've got a set of questions here, and bearing in mind the sort of the comms difficulties, I just want to sort of go through some of them before I bring some of the other people in. Um, the first one is, um, have building control NIs, contacts in other parts of the United Kingdom indicated whether the changes to building regulations in other jurisdictions are understood by the industry, and are they also proving to be enforceable by building control authorities in the rest of the UK? My, un my understanding, maybe try and, and answer that. My understanding is that the, the, the non-combustible route to compliance for relevant buildings, um, you know, for for relevant buildings over eighteen meters, has brought clarity to the situation, um, and obviously, uh, you know, functional regulation. Previously, there was no limits to the routes you could use to prove compliance to the regulator uh, or to the enforcer. So that certainly brings clarity. Uh, I do. I do think that there is an opinion across the industry that perhaps there's there's limited flexibility, which would have been provided by the large scale fire testing route. Okay. Um, so my, my second question is: um, the department appeared to suggest that it's a widely held view that what is built on site rarely replicates what is tested in the laboratory in the BS eight four one four test. Is this building control NIE's experience? In other words, would it be sensible to permit the use of BS 8414 tests in order to establish fire safety compliance, given that, that what is tested is apparently not always which is used on site? And perhaps that is a nod to the fact that desktop studies would invariably review. So a system may be tested and be deemed safe. Invariably, that system rarely goes on a building because people will not use that exact system and may have product substitutions and may use a desktop study where somebody would attribute the fire performance of the substituted product being equal to the one in the tested system, and those would be replaced, and that would be accepted by the building control body. We think that route should be um, avoided and that any system that goes on a building should be as per it, the test that has been tested to the large scale fire test. Okay, thanks. And um, Building Control NI had referred to numerous industry validating systems which are designed to demonstrate compliance with fire safety mm -hmm. regulations. Is it Building Control's opinion that these numerous systems and assessments in lieu of tests? Are generally unreliable and should therefore be prescribed. Sorry, just repeat that question again. Yeah, sir. Sort of building control had referred to, your research had referred to numerous industry validating systems which are designed to demonstrate compliance with fire safety requirements. Is it your view that these numerous systems and assessments, in lieu of tests, are generally unreliable? 
No, look, the industry, uh, look, if we look to what's in the Northern Ireland uh, guidance, the Northern Ireland guidance has one route to compliance and it's to limit the combustibility of the insulation materials. Across the rest of the UK, there are probably two or three routes to compliance. So and obviously in England, um, you have the non-combustible route to compliance, you have the limited combustibility route to compliance, and you have large-scale system testing. There's no evidence to invalidate, invalidate either of those three routes to compliance. The issue we would have is in the desktop reviews of tested systems or in you know, uh, a, a far engineered proposal from first principles. But with regards to the non-combustible route that's in place in England for relevant buildings, with regard to the limited combustibility route that's in place for non-relevant buildings, and with regard to the testing route, we have no issues with those, and there is no evidence that those in a real fire scenario have been invalidated. And if there is, we would be keen to see that evidence. Look, it's one of the things that is, I'm not saying puzzled the committee, but we've, we've become a, it has become apparent as we've received evidence, is that there's multiple routes across the United Kingdom, which from somebody who, and we are not experienced in this area and we're just gathering evidence as it comes through, it seems strange that there are multiple different scenarios within the UK about looking towards fire safety. And one would have presumed yeah. it would have been to the... Uh, you know the, the alert, pro, you know the alert process. It would have been as uh, as low as risk as possible, whichever approach it was. But you've alluded to the fact that, that look, there's three different systems coming through. So you know what should we be recommending? Should we be looking at uh, sort of one system and about what you know? I just can't get to the bottom of why we have three different approaches to this. Yeah. Yes, because the existing routes to compliance were testing. So there would be large scale system testing and there would have been using materials that were of limited combustibility. That's historically been the route to compliance in England for several years. Um, the difficulty that they faced was after Grenfell, there was a bit of a backlash in terms of the regulations and how certainly the limited combustibility route was framed in guidance. And they have taken the, the decision in England to go with the most cautious approach for the highest risk buildings. So they have decided to just go with the non combustible route to compliance. There was a review of building regulations and fire safety in England by Dame Judith Hackett, who did not conclude that that was necessary. They did not conclude that there was any specific issue with the existing routes, provided that the rules were clarified. However, they decided for relevant buildings, the most highest risk situation, to go for non-combustible Class A1 and A2 products. The two remaining systems for all other buildings over 18 metres, the, the, the reason there's two is that the testing route gives you flexibility to combine combustible materials. So like PIR insulation, PUR insulation could be tested in assembly and deemed safe, whereas it would not pass the limited combustibility rule. So if you limit that to just one rule, and it has to be on combustibility, you rule out there's only one insulation on the market, for example, that will meet the standard for limited combustibility or non-combustibility. So the testing route gives the industry flexibility for product variation and selection and, and, and kept the scope for innovation. They just decided to go with the more cautious approach for the most highest risk buildings, which is why they moved relevant buildings to that to to uh, non combustible. Okay. Any other members? Do you want to come in? Any other members? Do you want to come in? Is there anybody out there? Yeah. Let me hear you. Uh, sure. Yes, Pat. Uh, I mean, I'm just looking, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I missed a little bit out, but just for uh, anyone that finds that they're in a building there at the moment, will there be any short and medium term consequences for existing buildings which are not subject to alteration or change in purpose? 
No, any new proposal uh, that would come out of these uh, this consultation will only apply to new buildings or buildings um, you know created by material change of use. We do find the industry you know in renovations of buildings will pick up on these new standards. And whilst I say our own current guidance is weak, the industry generally have not exploited that guidance and have tended to follow the routes to compliance that would have been in other parts of the UK for several years. So any new requirement that comes comes in will not apply to existing buildings. However, existing buildings would probably mostly in the main comply with the existing rules that have been there in England for some time now. Okay, thanks. Sorry, just to say that again. So, the industry themselves believe that the uh, the regulations in Northern Ireland is weak at the moment. Did I pick that up correctly? Well, look, I work in Belfast City Council. We would have probably in the last three years have had 25 buildings over the 18 metre height threshold built in Belfast. None of those buildings would have exploited the fact that they could have been built with just insulation materials of limited combustibility. They've looked to the cladding system as well and looked to large scale fire tests and, and desktop reviews of those large scale fire tests. So invariably in the main, we would have uh, you know, had large scale fire tests being used to validate systems in Northern Ireland. So basically, there, even though the rules and guidance in Northern Ireland is relatively weak, industry itself, because it's used to build it in Manchester and London or wherever it happens to be, builds it to the same standard that it would have to have in sort of uh, in England or Wales. Yes, correct, yes. So again, that raises the question, if they're building it to the same standard in England and Wales, why aren't we following the same standards as England and Wales? That's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. We historically followed the system in England um, with delay. From 1973, we've followed the system of guidance and regulation in England. And I guess our current proposals are based on what's in England. And that's why there's a move to the non-combustible route and then clarifying bringing in large scale fire testing for the first time in our guidance and clarifying that the rules um, for limited combustibility extend to the cladding materials as well as the insulation materials. So we're, we are clarifying that now. Okay, thanks very much, Reid. Uh, just on the back of that then, Chair Alan, just on your building control and in your departments, uh, who are you relying on for alterations to existing buildings? Are you going to rely on contractors? If there are alterations, are you going to rely on documentation? Look, the responsibility for compliance with building regulations rests with the people carrying the work out, the people designing the work, the owner of the work. We, we would take the, the enforcement action. We're the enforcer, so we make inquiry into compliance. They're the people that are responsible for compliance, and we will make that inquiry into compliance. Thanks. Uh, any other members, any other questions? Uh, just a final question, uh, team. What other related changes to the law would Building Control NI like to see in order to improve compliance with fire safety requirements? Uh, maybe let my colleagues come in at some point on this, but I don't think there's one issue that we would raise specifically. Probably a discussion on fire safety generally to look at you know at our technical guidance documentation to see where we are in relation to. England, Scotland, Wales, and the Republic of Ireland to see how we can further improve, I guess, both our regulations and our guidance and bring them up to speed with what's happening in other parts of the UK and in the island of Ireland. Sorry, are we not doing that now? Sorry? Is that not being done now? No, there's other issues. You know, sprinkler provision. Uh, we have no, we have no um, sprinkler provision in domestic residential buildings of, of any height. In Wales, for example, they have domestic sprinkler provision in, in all houses. In Scotland, they have sprinklers in residential buildings down to 11 meters. Uh, there, there's there's issues in around, for example, our means of escape codes. We're, we're still 
referring to outdated means of escape codes for residential buildings. So there are issues that we can improve upon, I guess, from a fire safety perspective in both our regulations and our guidance across all regulations. There's there's five fire safety regulations. There's means of escape. There's internal fire precautions. There's external fire spread. All those issues would need to be reviewed in light of what's happening in other parts of the UK. Okay. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, just before I finish, uh, would you care to actually write to the committee with those recommendations and those particular issues that you've had and write to me at the committee here so that we will have that evidence and we may indeed pass yeah. that on to we will pass that on to the department as well. Yeah, just just to make you aware before we finish, I don't know if Tom wants to come in as a head of service, but we do have uh, regular meetings with the department where, where, where issues like this can be discussed. So I don't know, Tom, could you maybe Tom say a couple of words on that? Um, yeah, I do, and yes, we, we do, as Tom said, uh, meet with the department again very solid on a regular basis and to discuss these issues. Uh, and as Alan says, there are, there are five different elements to the uh, fire safety alone. Um, and the latest consultation was just focusing on one element, as it were. But we can write to the committee by all means um, and, and give you some sort of feeling of the sort of stuff that we, we do discuss with them, if that would be of, of assistance. Uh, yes, please. Um, any, any other members, any other questions? Sorry. Tom, Martin, Sean, Alan, thank you very much indeed for your time and uh, please keep safe. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I ask Assembly uh, Broadcasting to remove the witnesses from spotlights? And have we achieved that? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, next item in the agenda. Sorry, sir, sir, do you want to get a formal agreement to ask oh, yes. uh, for building control to write to the committee in relation to the yes. issues raised uh, on regulations and guidance? Yes. Are we content? Agreed. Content. Great. Uh, next item on the agenda oral briefing, assembled research, uh, free ports and state aid. And we invite Colin and Aidan, who's up first. That'll be me, sir. Aidan. Yep, brilliant. So, um, I'm, uh, I'll just share my screen with you here. Yes, please, Ed. Oh, it's not allowed to do that. Probably have to install an extension. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll not do that. Um, I'll just go ahead. Uh, just um, to revise that, uh, Aidan's uh, paper on free ports and the Northern Ireland Protocols on page 138 on your papers. So, rather than having to play with the IT, if we go to page 138. Yeah, apologies for that, sir. I didn't expect that to happen. No, no, it's um, not. No, it's not your fault. Don't worry about it. So, um, as you say, uh, chair, I'm going to brief the committee on the paper um, on uh, uh, free ports and uh, the, the protocol. Um, uh, I'll do a number of things. Um, I'll quickly describe what free ports are and what uh, UK free port policy is and its relationship with with devolution. And then I'll look at, um, at the protocol. Uh, what we know so far about the um, interactions um, between potential interactions between the free port policy and the protocol, uh, and then I'll pass you on to Colin, who's going to talk a little bit more about about state aid. Um, so, before I get to that, just to point out, there are a, a number of limitations. Um, today, we don't have a firm policy proposal of what a free port in Northern Ireland will look like. As a consequence, commentary is limited. Um, both on the free port in general, but on the specific issue of how that free port might interact with the protocol. Um, so this paper uh, and this presentation really is a first look at these sort of issues, and um, we're happy to look again uh, as details become available and should the committee wishes to do so. So, uh, what is a free port? Um, essentially, they're designated areas within a custom uh, within a country where goods can be imported without tariffs being paid and simplified customs procedures applied. Tariffs are then paid when the goods are moved from the free port into the, the, the wider country. Um, they're also similar to enterprise zones in the sense that uh, governments often offer a range of incentives, such as tax breaks, to, um, to encourage businesses to, to um, locate there or uh, to set up there. Um, so the UK government policy on free ports will see the creation of 10, um, with at least one in each of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And as part of the government's levelling up agenda, um, to date, bidding has opened on free ports in England. 
Uh, we're waiting for details on Freeport's and devolved uh, regions to be confirmed, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so within England, a range of incentives are being offered. These include customs incentives, and that's the, the tariff, that includes tariff deferral. That's the idea of um, importing now, paying later that I mentioned earlier, but also tariff inversion, and that's something I'll come back to. But there's also a range of tax incentives, such as enhanced capital allowances, um, they'll offer simplified planning procedures. There'll be some seed capital funding of 175 million for regeneration uh, projects. There'll be some innovation competitions, and there'll also be the, the UK government see uh, a role for um, local governments um, to s provide support as well, um, either funded through local government borrowing or through enhanced or increased uh, business rates receipts. So. Uh, that's the whistle stop tour of the incentives, but they're, they're, they're spelled out in more detail in the paper beginning on page 146. So with regards to UK free port policy and devolution, as I mentioned, the government, the UK government is committed to free ports across the UK. Uh, and these are these this policy has been developed by the UK government. I'm sorry, sir, can you still hear me? Yeah, sorry, Aidan, you broke, you broke up there for a bit. Okay, um, so I was just saying that the, the details of uh, free ports and devolved regions will be announced as soon as possible. So on page uh, 151 of the packs, there's uh, a table um, outlining where uh, free port policy uh, over overlaps with um, devolved competencies, and these are the sort of issues that have to be worked through um, prior to the announcement of the policies in in the devolved regions. But uh, just to summarize that, essentially um, all planning policy is devolved um, and tax regeneration and innovation policy has is part devolved, part um, reserved. On top of that, there's the issue of uh, who will pay for the incentives that are offered in uh, free ports, um, whether these will be absorbed by the UK government or passed on to the devolved regions. Um, we don't know the answer to that as yet. So moving on to the, the I guess the, the crux of the committee's um, uh, interest in this uh, topic is the it's the, the relationship between free port policy and the protocol. So in general, it appears that the protocol does not stop the UK from developing a UK-wide policy that impacts Northern Ireland. However, Article 12 of the protocol requires that the UK apply a range of EU law in the UK with respect to Northern Ireland. And this includes things like the EU Customs Code, certain product standards and regulations, EU rules on VAT and excise, EU rules on state aid, and a range of uh, EU law with respect to wholesale electricity. So uh, the application of this uh, law may have consequences for the application of UK-wide policy in Northern Ireland. Um, so it's whereas, whilst the protocol doesn't stop um, the UK government from introducing policies that impact Northern Ireland, um, the, uh, the continued application of this EU law ensures that those policies um, should be designed in a way that are compatible with the EU law as it applies to Northern Ireland. This appears to be the case uh, for UK free port policy in relation to two areas. That's uh, the EU Customs Code and e e EU State Aid Rules. So, with regard to the Customs Code, um, the EU Customs Code is essentially the rules that govern um, uh, customs within the, the Customs Union. The, the protocol applies this to Northern Ireland, but not to, to GB. Now, according to the Centre for Policy Studies, this becomes an issue with free ports policy because it limits the application of uh, tariff inversion. Now, tariff inversion is a key benefit within free ports. Uh, it operates when a duty payable on a finished product is lower than that of the component parts. This allows manufacturers within the free port to import um, important parts without paying the, the higher rate of duty, build the, the final product, and then move that final product out of the free port into the rest of the, the, the country, um, paying the lower rate of duty on the final product. So according to the Centre for Policy Studies, tariff conversion is technically possible mm -hmm. under the Customs Code. However, there is a need for companies to um, secure uh, a, a, a special status to access the benefits of tariff inversion. EU member states also have the right to lodge complaints with the European Commission where tariff inversion is believed to harm businesses in their country. And there's also some other additional administrative requirements associated with the customs code. So 
the Center for Policy Studies argument holds that these the, the combination of these, these 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 burdens ensure the potential benefits of tariff inversion are outweighed by by the, the by the burdens. Um, and so the final area where there's um, uh, some overlap between the the, the protocol and free ports policy is state aid. Okay, state aid essentially uh, sets the limits on on the subsidy regime within within the EU. EU. So Northern Ireland remains subject to state aid rules with respect to um, trade and goods and wholesale electricity as per the protocol. This will, it will therefore include subsidies at free ports. The UK, by contrast, is now subject to a new state aid regime, which was in part set out by the Trade and Cooperation Agreement um, announced on Christmas Eve. It's just passed. So um, essentially, the UK is now in a position to set its own um, subsidy regime, um, so long as it um, follows some certain principles, most significant of which is that subsidies should not be granted where they could um, have a material effect on trade or investment between the parties. So this gives the UK uh, government the, the potential to um, diverge from uh, e EU um, subsidy policy. Um, so that with regard to free ports, that theoretically uh, at least allows, it opens up the possibility that free ports in England, Scotland and Wales can offer subsidies which are which will not be available to free ports in Northern Ireland. It's not clear at this stage whether that will be the case. Um, we don't have full details of uh, what the UK's subsidy regime will be. However, conveniently, a consultation was launched this morning, um, which I, I only found out about lunchtime, so I haven't had a proper chance to digest it. Um, but it's something we can come back to the committee on. Uh, as well, that consultation is going to run until the the, the 31st of of March. So we hope to hear um, firmer details after that point as well. So with that, um, I'll, I'll pass on to Colin. He'll he'll look at CDA in more detail, please. Thank you. Yep. Yes, please. Thanks. Thanks for that, Colin. In. Yep. Sorry, sorry, Colin. Sorry, Colin. Uh, can't hear you. Can we unmute Colin? That should be me now. Yeah, sorry, well done. Sorry, sorry about that, Colin. No worries, that's, that's, that's my fault. I always forget to, uh, to hit that right. Now, um, can you see my screen okay? We can. Yeah, okay, I don't know why, why I can do it, but Aidan couldn't. Right, my... Um, my uh, purpose here is to just try and um, go over quickly what the EU state aid um, regime is all about, which is set out in the paper from, uh, I think it's page 163 of your packs. So there's, there's, there's information in there, which is more detailed Colin, than I'll give you now. Colin, can you select slideshow? Just see oh, it just makes that sense. That is slideshow, but not, hang on. Hang on. Is that displaying as a slideshow now? Uh, no, I think that's on the draft one. It's just, it's just a bit, it's just a bit difficult for some of our elderly brethren, like me, to be able to read the screen. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, right, well, oh yeah, I see it's not showing. Why isn't it showing full screen? Hold on. Let me try another. Um, let me see if I can um, share the PDF. Let's see if that works. Is that any clearer? Yes. Yeah, okay. So 
Good. Um, so, apologies for that. So the state aid rules are seen as being incredibly important for the functioning of the EU's internal market, um, described by a, a QC as being essentially the keystone to the single market, um, which is important in relation to the protocol and, and the uh, recent agreement because of the level playing field uh, considerations. So the purpose of them is to prevent unfair subsidy within the single market and um, obviously it will continue to apply under the protocol uh, and the intention is that that will prevent undue distortion of competition and trade. Um, now in relation to the recent uh, UK-EU agreement, cooperation agreement, the UK has a number of um, commitments. It is to establish an independently enforced domestic regime and it has to comply with the broad principles of the treaty. Um, and then just to point out that there are some exceptions to that, for example, at times of national or global economic emergency, uh, and I suppose that includes the moments that we're in at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, there is a requirement for an independent regulator whose implementation and regulation of the scheme is subject to review by the UK courts, and then there's, there's also provision for a mechanism for arbitration. Um, now, the UK government at the moment has published uh, guidance on state aid under the, under the existing regime, not the one that, that Aidan mentioned earlier, which is now just out to consultation. Um, so well, that sets out how the UK proposes it will meet its international ob obligations, uh, gives guidance to authorities and then further technical guidance. Um, it's probably worth pointing out that in relation to agriculture and fisheries, the technical guidance does require public authorities to DRF. Um, so there is, a, there is a role for a Northern Ireland department in relation to consultation or agreement of our proposed aids. And then in relation to proposed subsidies by UK government departments, the UK authorities are required to the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, so it's not, um, they, they don't have to consult with, or they're not referred to the Department for the Economy, yet. it's a slightly different kind of approach. Um, in relation to the consultation that was published this morning, I haven't had time to look at it in any detail, but essentially what it's doing is setting up principles, which it says will comply with the UK's obligations, ensuring interventions are consistent with international obligations, including the Golden Island Protocol. And then it goes on to use language like flexible, agile, tailored to support business growth. But actually what that, that ends up meaning, um, it would need a more detailed uh, look and probably some uh, advice from the department with experience of dealing with these matters, I suspect. Um, but to go back to the the protocol itself now article 10 obviously requires um there to be controls on state aid in relation to northern ireland and and then it, it lists uh, a whole load of um eu laws regulations and procedural rules they call procedural rules which apply to the uh the restrictions and, and what, what the UK government say is a, an overly complex system, that, which is why they want to replace it with, with their, their proposed new system. Um, now, the uh, has specific exemption in relation to agriculture. So in paragraph two of article 10 of the protocol, Agricultural production may be um, supported up to a certain limit. Now, on the 17th of December, that was agreed by the Joint Committee, um, and it can be up to 382 million per year, uh, and within exceptional circumstances, that can be raised by a further 6.8 million. So that, that gives them a bit of additional um, support there, uh, and a certain amount of unused support. Um, and this. I suppose this is something a little bit like we, we have the discussions about budget exchange and NGO flexibility. 
if there is unused support at the end of the year, up to 25 million may be carried forward into the following year without offending the, um, the, the overall limit. Colin, what's the 382 million based on? Does it rise every year in line with uh, inflation or with GNI or any other indicator? Um, it's based on the it's based on the existing um, the existing uh, amounts, and then the amount sorry the, the amount that was carried forward from the from the common agricultural policy, which obviously following Brexit no longer applies. Um, and then there's a now there's a there's an exchange rate that they use to determine it, which is set out in the um, in the uh, decision of the withdrawal agreement committee. Um, but it, it, it's essentially it, it, it's a it's a it's a steady state is the idea, um, and, and I think then, then there's provisions for it to be reviewed um, at a future point when when the current um, policy uh, period is is over. I think it's four years from now. So basically, that's that's it. It can't be it can't be uh, unless there is sort of exceptional mitigating circumstances i.e. sort of um, that you need the extra sort of 6.8 million for that's it that's the figure set in concrete for four weeks or four that, years and that's it that's it set at the moment yeah presumably subject to um subject to uh, reopening the negotiation again um which which there are i mean there are provisions for for decisions of the um joint committee to be uh looked at again if i remember rightly um, but quite, quite what those procedures are, I can't, I, I can't uh, speak to any detail. Um, uh, just to, uh, in a similar vein, chair, then, then there's a, an exemption then for fisheries and agriculture, which allows a much smaller amount of support for those uh, sectors. Um, 16.93 million over five years, uh, and that's capped. So there's a slightly different approach. It's capped to a maximum amount for a single year, but the, but the overall amount is set for the five-year period, um, and it's limited for what it can be used. And it can't be used to buy a whole new um, fleet of fishing vessels or to outfit fishing vessels, um, but it can be used in certain limited circumstances like serious threat to the marine ecosystem or a health emergency or, or something along those lines. So just just to understand this, Colin, because I mean, there's been implications that within uh, GB fisheries were getting additional monies, potential additional monies. But what we're saying here in Northern Ireland, because of the um, state aid rules, the figure is capped at 16.9 uh, three million for the five years, regardless of whether any extra monies come in or not. And uh, from my maritime experience, four million doesn't buy you much of a fishing boat. Uh, well, it's not allowed to be for a fishing boat. So, um, but uh, I, I, I don't know much about the the, uh, the the price of fishing boats actually, so I'm, I, I couldn't really comment. But um, that yes, that amount is capped. I mean, it's it's a relatively small industry, obviously in Northern Ireland, although it's important to those communities which it, it is um, it supports uh, in, in overall terms. It's 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 a small, it's small business. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, but there is there is money uh, specifically set aside in the spending review in November, which is under the, I suppose what you might call the, the sort of EU replacement funding sort of ban or outside of the normal Barnet formula allocations, which which is where that that uh, support money would come from, I suppose. Um, but it's, it's, it's additional to the, the usual funding that Northern Ireland would get. But for things like improvements to ports and port facilities, obviously one of the things we want to do is spend a considerable amount of money on upgrading Kilkeel as for both fishing and for other uh, uh, marine and maritime uh, activities. So would that figure the additional funding to come from that, would that be deemed to come out of the 16.93 million or would that come under different state aid rules? Uh, well, that's a, good, that's a good question. It's one I, to, I can't totally answer because, because I only picked out certain numbers of the limitations. I think improving the capacity of the dock will be different from, from um, actually just uh, 
attaching, you know, working on the fleet itself. But I, um, I would have to come back to you on that. I mean, the um, I suppose the issue there is that the, the point you raised about the, the quantum of the money, um, if it's not going to buy you much of a boat, presumably it's not going to do much in terms of capital investment in a in a um, fishing port. No. Um, at the same time, I suppose there's the potential that the the um, free ports policy, when that comes about, that may be that may be something that that considers. You know, actually the the infrastructure of the ports themselves. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, that that that's actually my my run through if there are any further questions um whether it's whether it's relating to those or or to aiden's part aiden will be able to jump back in if necessary okay uh, matthew thank you chair um first of all we're saying i think that just to answer the question not all spending is state aid so spending could happen on a an industry that wouldn't have to necessarily qualify as a state aid um can i just ask aiden in particular that aiden you really have from the points out that they're there's a bit of there's a grey area really around the definitions of free ports, and uh, so there, there is no hard legal definition. The UK government did a consultation last year, but there's no one unified uh, uh, canonical definition. It can mean a anything for it generally means uh, a certain specified set of rules around customs regulations, some po possibly some tax incentives, but generally it's a special economic zone. Is that a fair description? Yes, that's a fair assessment. Uh, especially like a economic zone that tends to be located near a port uh, um, and has some sort of customs um, incentive. It's, so thinking about the position Northern Ireland is in now, where we are the only part of Western Europe from which we can actually, from which goods can move in, we're the only part of the UK into which goods can move into the EU single market unfettered. Uh, we are the only... Uh, part uh, we, we have unfettered access to the gb market from goods going from here into gb there are specific issues obviously around east west coming from east to west um that we're working on but in one sense northern ireland already is a special economic zone with access to i'm not asking you might not want to but but, but i'm just thinking through the if the, given the definition isn't perfected uh, we tend to i think we might meet some of the um, definitions already? Um, I, I don't know if, uh, if I should comment on that, but um, what I, 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 I can um, say is that I believe the, the FSB and others have put forward proposals of, of, of making Northern Ireland uh, in, entirely uh, a free port zone or a special economic zone, so that might be worth um, uh, the committee investigating further. But certainly one, one I don't want to put you in, a, in an invidious position, but I think it's worth saying, it is, tr is it true to say that one of the key p parts from your note seems to be that goods can move, a, there's a particular quality to the ease with which goods can move um, uh, a, into and out of um, a free port? Mm -hmm. Well, no, it, it, it means, it, I, 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 in that sense, no, I don't think you could qualify Northern Ireland because it would mean goods entering from anywhere would be without a tariff and um, with relaxed customs procedures before they move um, else to, to the main market. So whilst, whilst goods can move into Northern Ireland from the EU without tariffs, um, from other countries, um, say the USA, there's there, there's there will still be tariffs applied, and um, whether that be the UK tariff or the EU tariff depends on the final destination. Um, <clears throat> but in that sense, a free port itself would will be required to enable things like um, the, the the tariff deferral, the tariff inversion on goods coming from from areas outside the EU. Yeah, yeah. Given that there is new. Uh, we're obviously in a situation where we're um, the, all this is still working itself out and being implemented, and, and even the Freeports thing is itself in the process of being defined and defined by the UK government. But the protocol provides for Northern Ireland to be in a, basically in a special economic position vis-à-vis -vis access to two markets. Nothing you can have a Freeport 
within EU rules, albeit there are certain prohibitions related to state aid, and the UK government is committed to creating free ports, it would seem to me that there is a useful overlap and elision of interest that is provided for by Northern Ireland's dual market access, the EU's uh, allowing of pro, uh, free ports and indeed the UK government's um, uh, willingness to um, implement them. I, you might not want to comment on that, Aidan, but it just seems to me to be an interesting, uh, an, an interesting opportunity there. Um, uh, I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to, thanks, thanks very much indeed. Um, Aidan, sort of, uh, Shannon is still a free port, isn't it? One of the oldest free ports, but it has, it's a free port within uh, sort of the EU, it's outside the EU customs territory, isn't it? Sure, I'd have to get back with you on that. I didn't look at any specific examples of free ports for, for, for this paper, but uh, I'm happy to do so, um, just to clarify that. Yeah, I, I, just, I just think it's a, you know, it's, it's an interesting perspective, but we could make the entirety of Northern Ireland a free port, would make it very useful. So that way we'd have we a policy. We already are, Steve. Uh, uh, news for you, Sunshine, it's not. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, Are Jim. There? How many uh, free ports are there in the EU at present? 80. It's in the region of 86. I can get to the precise number in a second. Apologies. Um, I was at the bottom of the document and this is near the top. Um, apologies. Uh, in, in Europe, there's uh, 105. Um, within the EU, there are 80 currently in operation. When, when, uh, what's the most recent free port in the EU? Uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have an answer to that, um, except to say that where they do exist, the, um, the, the, the commentary seems to suggest that they're legacies that yes. predates um, a country's uh, EU membership. Yes. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the EU is very adverse to the very notion of free port because it conflicts with some basic tenants touching upon their single customs union and single market. Um, and certainly the, the literature suggests that EU free ports tend to be limited compared to those elsewhere in the world. Yes. And so that the European Parliament um, uh, raised concerns in 2019 that they encouraged uh, money laundering and uh, tax evasion. Yes. So I think in the modern EU, they're very much frowned upon. Uh, but in this, in your paper, it demonstrates to me yet another huge prejudice of the protocol via Northern Ireland. Because under the protocol, we are retained uh, within the EU Customs Code. Isn't that, that's correct? Yeah. And we are also uh, subject to their state aid rules, which combined, which combined together defeats the whole ethos and purpose of a free port. Um. Well, it, it certainly it certainly seems to, to limit it. Um, I, I don't think. I'm not sure if it defeats it. Um, I, it would have to be designed in such a way that it's compatible. Um, well, for example, the enhanced allowances uh, would be subject to state aid rules, uh, and therefore would be crippled by those. The um, EU VAT regime to which we're subject, and their Customs Code would be grossly offended by the idea that you might have lower tariffs, which is why, of course, the EU of today is opposed to, to free ports. So the chances of a, of a functioning free port on a par with what could be established elsewhere in the UK is effectively nil, courtesy of the protocol. I'd suggest it. Um, I, I, I'm without stating the, the, the final proposal, I, I'm not sure what, 
Yes, Pat. Thanks very much. Just what Jack said. You know, it's good if products come in uh, parts from, you say, the, the wider EU and were assembled in Northern Ireland, we could sell them straight away into the United Kingdom market. So that technically is the free port status. So really, Jim, Mr. Alistair is wrong on that point. With respect, I think that the whole modus operandi of a free port is that you can have enhanced alliances in relation to your tariffs. But once you impose state aid rules, then those are notional rather than real. So the whole bottom is, the whole bottom is kicked out of the whole concept of a free port by reason of the state aid rules. Well, we have that at the moment. We can bring any product we want in through, in, into Northern Ireland, the in Northern Ireland, and sell it to the main UK market. Subject to the EU customs code. No. Which is which is set at odds with the whole concept of free ports. No, that is there at the minute, Jim. That is written in on the protocol. Well, you try it's one we back up on. Maybe Rays will come back to us on that. Well, Gent gentlemen, well, gentlemen, 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 I, I, I appreciate the dialogue, but uh, with the sound quality and the rest of it, that's fully understood. I, I do <coughs> have a few... Finish up. Uh, that'll do. I, I have a... Uh, just a question to Colin and Aidan, and it's a question about, uh, and please, somebody, if I'm pronouncing this wrong, the justability of state aid rules, does that lie with the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, the European Court of Justice, or the Northern Ireland Courts? Where does that lie within Northern Ireland? Because one of the issues, of course, we will look at uh, later on, and I think it's uh, state aid in the European Court of Justice. But the question here lies with where does that sort of the ultimate justability and the role of the ECJ lie within that? So that raises some questions. Um, and again, that comes to, you know, when we're trying to look at the ease of trying to improve the Northern Ireland economy, because obviously when we come the other side out of COVID, we're wanting to be able to give it significant amounts of stimulus. And one of the things that the finance minister is looking to do is to build up sufficient amounts of stimulus that can then be used later on. But how does this apply? How is the likelihood of this being looked at when we're looking at state aid rules? And where does the justability lie at it? Uh, who are we going to be dragged in front of? The, which court are we going to be dragged in front of if ECJ. we try and be innovative? ECJ. And the protocol... Is that me? Yeah, yes, please come. And the protocol, it would be the ECJ. Yeah. Um, but um, there is, there's, another, there's another issue which we raised in the paper that we haven't touched upon at the moment in relation to providing incentives. And actually, that's about the, uh, the funding for doing that or the cost of doing it. So if you have um, provide an incentive, whether it's reduced tariffs or duties or taxes in an, in an enterprise zone, um, the, the usual mechanism for devolution of taxes to Northern Ireland from the UK is that Northern Ireland will pay for any lost revenue. And it seems to me that there's certainly an issue that needs to be considered in relation to if, if at such point the UK comes forward with proposals for a free ports policy, um, it would then need to be considered in relation to the operation of the Treasury's statement of funding policy and how the interaction of the tax devolution principle would work with any lost revenue in effect to the UK exchequer um, on the basis of, of introducing those uh, those um, tax incentives. And bearing in mind to use my very honourable friend from South Belfast analysis, of course we're still pairing for long distance air flights with uh, APD going back to Treasury that we're not actually using. And for some reason, we can't find a mechanism to stop it. Sorry. Right. Anything else? Um, Tommy Tax. Yeah, no, no comment on that one. But I mean, it, <laughs> yeah, um, it, it does seem to be that that is a, a, a thorny issue. Okay, team. Have we any other? Have we any other questions?
Colin, Ian, thank you very much indeed, yet again, for your excellent research. And I think that's raised quite a few, uh, that's provided not necessarily a large degree of clarity, but it's allowed us to be much better informed about some of the, the thought processes going forward. But thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Ian and Colin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, remind members that, as previously agreed, the clerk is a process of co commissioning with the Committee for the Executive Office external expert advisors to attend the committee in order to provide some levels of enlightenment in respect of matters relating to the Northern Ireland Protocol, including VAT, etc. Just wanted to remind you of that as well. And if we're going to ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove Aidan and Colin from the, the link. Uh, move on to item 10, correspondence. And I can ask Assembly Broadcasting to keep all members in the spotlight for the next four agenda items. Right. Uh, first item is uh, the correspondence index, um, construction uh, at page 177, uh, construction employers federation submission to the draft budget 2122. Uh, drawing members attention to the correspondence at page 180, which is a submission from the construction employers federation regarding the draft budget. Uh, construction employers, employers federation welcomes the RRI borrowing and funding for flagship projects but urge the provision of clarity on the casement park and the procurement of the Stroll project. Members, do we have any comments? Uh, I would like to make a comment. Uh, first of all, I'd like to commend the Construction Employers Federation. I don't know if any of you read this uh, document when it comes out for each draft budget, but it's actually it's a very well researched and it's a very useful uh, piece of, um, and it looks at some of the key areas and issues that we have to deal with. And, and each time there's been a lot of particularly good um, information within that as well. Uh, at some stage, bearing in mind the tightness of the programme we have with the sort of the budget coming up, I think it might be useful if we had oral evidence from the Constru uh, Construction Employers Federation, and particularly when it comes to discussions around issues about RRI and how we can use that funding in an imaginative way. And I would also think about FTC as well, if we would be content to do that. Agreed. Uh, next item, members of the public clinically extremely vulnerable. Uh, draw members' attention to restricted correspondence on page 184 from a member of the public asking for a COVID support scheme to be added to the clinically extremely vulnerable who are unable to work. Do we have any comments? If we're content, I'd like to write to the Department of Health and seek clarity on the timescale by which the CEV individuals will be vaccinated and be able to return to work. Are we agreed? Uh, Department for Economy COVID uh, Business Support Schemes. Response from the Department for Economy at page 185, which details the business support schemes operated by the Department of the Economy. The table includes the High Street Voucher Scheme, the funding for which was surrendered in January monitoring. But as understood, Department for Economy is seeking to launch in 21 22 with a possible cost of 140. Now, I'm all for increased support. And I think there is much of increased support should be going, particularly to the wet pubs and the new down employed schemes as well. But we don't have a lot of clarity on how the money has been brought back in, how it's going to be changed from 95 million to 140 million, and how that's going to be managed. And we still haven't had any uh, observations or haven't any commentary from the department on whether the Treasury is agreeing to these changes. Um, Members, do we have any comments? Yeah, to be fair to them yet again, uh, I think for most of us, this is the biggest item in our inbox, is, is the localised restriction grants for no, etc. Uh, and again, one by one, uh, they're knocking them down. As far as I'm concerned, one by one, they are coming to a successful conclusion. I at the last meeting asked for clarification on the, uh, the director's payments. Now, that has now become clear what's going to happen there. Mm -hmm. That's now open for a, a payment uh, and very welcome because they were the left behind, as it were. So uh, pro progress there. Still no indication yet of where the, where the 9,000 9, per business is going to go ahead. Uh, I'd like to see something on that. And I'd like a further update on where the properties which had a rateable value of more than £50,000, where they now stand. Now, I know, again, there's movement on that, so I'm not complaining. Why well, do you like an update? Yeah, it's just a bit, it's about a year, but a, but a year late, really, isn't it, <laughs> to be yeah. honest? Uh, bit by bit, we're catching these people, 
but some of them are in pretty desperate straits after almost a year of no, no, no trading. Okay. We content to write to the department for that. Yeah. Matthew. Yeah. Melissa, you can come in first, please. Sorry, Melissa. Sorry, was, were you going to say something, Melissa, or are you just? Lisa. No. Uh, content. Yeah. Oh, content. Oh, good time. Sorry. No, no, sorry. Go ahead, Matthew. Just on the. No, I, I, I don't say it to make a kind of as an attack or political point, but just genuinely the 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 the, the, the quite the, the, amount, the amount not spent on newly self-employed and wet pubs. I don't know if it's just simply because. Is there? Did they give us a reason why it's so low? Presumably not. Just that, you know the, the the wet pubs one. If it's, I can't remember now what the, what the amount was of wet. Was it ten thousand to go to each wet pub? That's yeah. Twelve pubs. Um, which seem like there's a like a, a structural problem there around pubs not knowing about it or. Okay, no, that's not the driver's game, is it? It's on both. Well, it's on both. Sorry, apologies for that. I'm just trying to catch up. Just go on. Sorry, go ahead, Pat. Uh, 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 this has been ongoing from the start. So, so it has to be welcome. I know it's a year, a year late, but there has been some help, at least got in level as it is on the rates. But we have to at least try to welcome that they're getting there. Yes, it would be great if it was much quicker. And I do have to say an interest here, which I never thought of earlier. Uh, my sister is in one of those brackets in one of the pubs she has in Belfast. So, but it does have to, I mean, they are tricky and they're hard trying to, to work through them where they did not uh, get any of that money, which was uh, meant out to the WAC pubs. And it also affects all hotels, which Mr. Jim Wells and ourselves brought up at that last meeting that we had. In uh, our last committee meeting. Uh, fair enough. I just, I'm, I'm just. Uh, my question was just: Is it? So I think the. I'm looking at the, this rule. I think began on the 11th of January, and I, I'm just surprised. That's that might that might be maybe I'm a bit overreacting, but just the starting the 11th of January that we were we this table I think is dated the 28th of January. So that's. Yeah. I suppose that's just over a fortnight, but maybe it takes that long for them to process the applications. I don't know. Yeah. Um, just then, it's also related to there's another table item as uh, correspondence received from the ABBA Driving School about business support. And I think it's on table at page 37 regarding the absence of business support for driving schools. And obviously, this is all part and part of the process of the ongoing thing, Jim, as you've stated. It's, yeah, I, I got that letter as well. Um, it's quite clear they can't, you, can't, you can't teach people to drive. drive. I mean, it's, it's quite clear it's one of those things where there's close contact. Yep. And yet, for some reason, there seems to be a difficulty in getting the localised restriction money. Um, I presume they are getting both either the self-employed furlough scheme or the employed furlough scheme. Um, if you actually read the criteria for the localised restriction money, it's, it's quite clear uh, that they I should don't be see why they're not getting yeah. But I just don't wonder... Uh, is is there a problem with with the people who are processing and have they overlooked that? Yeah, I think I would uh, probably like to, with your secure agreement, to write to the department for clarity in this. Again, also asking for support for driving schools, and also lessons learned from the underspent scheme. Sure, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Melissa. Sure, yeah, yeah, just in fact. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, Melissa. Uh, I received that. And I uh, have requested uh, that information. I, I can hear an echo. Are you seeing an echo as well, are you? Yeah. It's not my connection here, but I don't know. Uh, uh, we pursued the same uh, issue. And I even thought to myself, is it the case that for the, uh, the actual driving school itself, it's like an umbrella for maybe self employed instructors? Mm -hmm. uh, reason that uh, in some way they then. Fall down because, uh, just as Mr. Wells has said, you can see that in every other respect they seem to be meeting the criteria. But uh, I do think that there's actually a problem in there. Uh, uh, so, that in writing to them, you're going to be one of many. I think that a lot of other people have probably have written to him too because uh, the ABBA school, they definitely have uh, utilized all the resources and contact and all MLAs, not obviously. 
Sorry, just on that, and I hear everybody says about this, and it is really difficult to catch everyone. But there are still so many sectors out there who not haven't been able to get anything. Now, it may be that their businesses are quirky, but they are still dependent on government to help them because either their trade or their supplies have dried up or they have been forced to stop operating. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest issues, I think, is the travel agent industry and especially the independent travel agent industry who have given back a lot of money for refund. It's not that their business stopped. Their business stopped and then they had to give refunds. Uh, and a lot of that came from people's personal savings, just to cover the costs. And they're left in dire straits. We mentioned the, the driving schools. There's also another sector, and that is tour guides in Northern Ireland. People who run tour operations. And it's usually just a one man one man or one woman system whereby they have had a they had a full diary of events for a year uh, up to a year where they were taking people up the north coast around belfast on tour guides and tours and all of that work just dried up and some of them people had only just started up and they seemed to fall through all the the cracks now these are the people who would we'd want to inspire and to to build up their base and their business, the entrepreneurial spirit that we're all trying to engage in and, and promote, those people have been up for six. Uh, and it's not all about the Department of the Economy, of course. Most of the departments, uh, Department of Finance, Department of Infrastructure, other departments need to you know, come in here with other bids. But there seems to be this element of people of all types of self-employed who just because they became self-employed at a particular time, either in the year, or in a, in a period. And it seems to strike Bellamina quite hard on the surrounding areas because of the two big job loss mm -hmm. uh, impacts uh, with JTA and Mitchell. So a lot of people then went out on their own doing all sorts of arts and parts and, and, and work. And a lot of them have been impacted because of the timing yeah. issue. Uh, because some of them was only starting to come into profit whenever COVID hit. And they had maybe a couple of years or a year uh, with a negative loss put thing with regards to startup, uh, and those people have been affected really badly. Uh, and I again, how do you actually get to, to those people? How do you target them? And how do you create that scheme that they yeah, could that, get that to? covers as many people? And we will get to a point where we're looking at ones and twos. Yeah. But th those people still need support, and it's getting to that, getting to, getting to those ones and twos. You know. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Ray. So, can I have your agreement to write to the department for the clarity on support for driving schools, lesson learned from the underspend schemes, and again seeking clarity on the way forward with the voucher scheme? Are we agreed? Great. Chair. Chair. Is that? So, Philip. Sorry. Hello. Sorry, I had, I had raised my hand electronically there. Uh, I, I just want to come in before you move on uh, because it, it is an important issue. I don't disagree with any of what previous members have said in terms of support uh, for uh, groups, individuals and organisations where they have, I mean, I could add to that, and I was late, so I, I hope this wasn't, uh, or sorry, I'm late coming back, but I mean, the, our town centres and businesses that, you know, some of them even that, that were allowed to stay open uh, during some of the restrictions, but because of foot, the lack of footfall. So, I mean, th there were businesses that at periods were allowed to stay open, but nobody was going into town centres or city centres shopping, so their, their, their trade was being impacted. So, I mean, potentially something that could be looked at there. And, I mean, I, I also have been contacted recent in recent days by uh, the, the, the wedding prov providing sector, and, and I know, you know that's big hotels, and, and some of that will be catered for, but there are other people who uh, cater uh, and put on wedding functions and service weddings that, that aren't catered for and I know that the Scottish government uh, released a fund uh, with 20 or 30 million in it uh, so I mean there's a, there's a sector that could be dealt with as well I mean I, I represent North Antrim like, like some of the colleagues on the committee uh, which is heavily reliant on the tourist trade but there are people involved in that trade who don't do it from a rateable property uh, and you know they too uh, are suffering at this particular time and are struggling 
to meet the criteria of some of the grants. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, there are definitely people out there who have fallen through the net, uh, through the various schemes. And, you know, it is, I mean, a lot of it is the Department for the Economy, but, you know, the, the, there's money available. And, you know, I'm not saying we should be throwing money out, but there are people who need money and schemes could and should be developed uh, in the remaining period in this financial year, I think, to get it out to the people that need it. Okay. Thank you, Philip. I, I would agree with Philip. I'll just give you an example from my own area. Dry cleaners are allowed to remain open. But there's no weddings, there's no balls, there's no big events, there's nobody coming to get their, their suits or their dresses cleaned. So they're, they're, they're caught between a situation where their turnover has dropped dramatically, but they're not entitled to claim any grant aid because they're not compelled to close. And for a lot of them, it would be much more profitable to close and take the money now open at the moment. I know because I'm one of the very few people that actually visits my dry cleaners anymore because nobody else needs to get suits cleaned. Uh, and that's, a, that's one of those situations I think that Phil has identified of people who have fallen through the net. And I think there should be a catch-all clause to use some of this surplus money for people who can show they don't fall into any category but their business has collapsed as a result of coronavirus. Can I add to that also? Because not only are dry cleaners affected that way, the dry cleaner trade is, is uh, depended upon by all the sports teams that play on a Saturday morning, who train on a Tuesday night, a Thursday night, all of that is gone. So if you're a dry cleaner who serviced 10 football teams, two rugby teams, three hockey teams, and five GAA teams, that trade is gone. And it's gone overnight. And that's not looking like it's coming back anytime soon. That's a massive issue and probably the bulk of a dry cleaner's routine trade now. That's gone. What, what was the name of the... Do you remember Ulster University? Who was the economic think tank? Economic Policy Centre. Gareth yeah. Hetherington. Sorry, get, say that again? Yeah, uh, Gareth Hetherington, yes. I believe, was the name of the economist. In the U -U EPC. The no, but I Center. think the thing has been identified here by Philip, by Paul and uh, by Jim, and uh, again, by Pat, by all of us, of all around. You know, the fact is that the people who are falling through the cracks, but that idea of a catch-all clause, and I just wonder if it's worth um, writing to the department whether they can consider asking, and I think it was also University did a lot of the research on rates in the first place. Remember, they're the ones who looked at sort of the rating reform and how the rating system could be transformed to give money out as well as bring money in. Might be worth writing to them to see if, I, look, I... I, I couldn't work out how we could get a catch-all clause, but there'd be bigger brains than mine would be able to have a look at that. Could it be a possibility of asking for the department to ask that to commission them to look at this? Yeah, I think so. I think there's a yes, and I think I sort of said something. I, Jim Wells said something. I think that's right. I said I, I said something similar to, to the minister that uh, you know about this about using some of the underspend or thinking about allocating some of it. Now, obviously, there's issues around the flexibility and the rules. Um, it's a little bit goes back to what that table, which I think that table was useful because it's highlighted where areas where, you know, the schemes aren't the money's going out. Some of that's just because they've just been open recently. But um, the the nature of how we do policy here and the nature of the pandemic, it, it's not anyone's fault. It just means that because we have a process of inviting bids and we have a process of individual MLAs having. Mm travel agent come to them or you know a wedding person those are all really legitimate things but it means that sometimes policy gets made in reaction and that yeah. sometimes that is a necessary thing but what you're talking about I think is a wise thing which is getting the department to come up with a, like something more systematic which is this is our judgment on the key areas of people who have been left behind is it for DOF or the executive um well Just I think I think I, I, sorry who was coming so in? Who's that? Lisa. Uh, Lisa? So you, yep. Uh, just uh, when we talk about uh, the quirky business, and I think you might have a notification of it as well, too, uh, that I've been dealing with the situation just that for. Um, the man uh, has dog kennels, and the, the way he just described it to me is uh, a dog kennel, in fact, is like a holiday home for dogs. And as people are not going on holidays now, there isn't the same demand for the holiday home for either. Uh, and uh, he's one of those quirky ones again, too, who's fallen through the bat and is looking for support there. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I think there's a, I think we've got a general consensus here. 
if they can write to the department and ask them to consider how commissioning, sort of urgently commissioning some research, how we could establish a, a we'll call it the Jim Wells scheme, scheme. the Jim oh. Wells Philip McGuigan scheme. Oh no, hang on, hang on. The, the Jim on. Wells quirky scheme. The Jim <laughs> Wells quirky scheme. But we do. I mean, the, the, we all as MLAs now have people who are falling through the gaps, and there is always elements of it that. Do, do look as if they could, should be getting some form of support or elements that they don't or there's something that's not just quite right. But the imperative is to use the resource we have to maintain the economic stability of Northern Ireland post we come out of COVID. And regrettably, the way things are going with COVID, the recovery period is going to be much longer than we have suspected. So I think even though this might take a, a few weeks or something to come up with a bespoke scheme of this, I think it's a valid piece of research and work that the department should do. The department come back to us and say, no, it shouldn't be us, it shouldn't be Department of Economy. Uh, to be honest, I'd rather have the Department of Finance doing it, uh, to be perfectly frank, to get, to get moving on it. But I think it does, give us, it does give us a degree of opportunity if we are content and agreed. Yeah, and that could mean different things, Chair. I'll tell you why, and why I think it should be at the Department of Finance's door. And it's simply this. It will be labour intensive whereby you might have to go out and assess what that business does and how it has been then impacted. But then there's a decision to be made as to how much support should that business receive. And in that case, it might not be a case of throwing money at it. It might be giving it some sort of relief. Yeah. Uh, which is the same thing ultimately to a book, a balance book. But, but that could be a more effective way of doing it rather than just throwing money. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think the Department of Finance should be looking at it. It might not necessarily be the best department to run the scheme, but it should definitely be the one looking at it. Yeah, and it's another issue I was going to raise, but with the committee. One of the things we've heard time and time again is the, the one organisation that has got a good indication of sort of finances and business and who's doing this is HMRC. Yeah. And one of the things that we don't have is a strong link between HMRC or either the Department of Economy or the Department of Finance. So indeed, one of the things I would suggest is within this research is how we improve that linkage between HMRC and sort of either the Department of Finance, or the Department of Economy to make that to make that to make that work. I'm just thinking of you know there is an imperative to get money to people. They will have at some stage or another paid VAT returns or tax returns or something like that. So they will have a unique identifier. And the ability to get to the people who have a unique identification number who hasn't had any supports to this stage might be the way to do this. But I'm not solutioneering, but I just sort of propose that as well. Yep. Are we agreed? Sir, yeah, Pat. In this, try, this try. tend to work one year behind on, on, on those returns. So uh, even for the past year that we had, there might give them some sort of a, an idea of, of what they were, what their capabilities and their overheads were and the bottom lines what the profits were in a good trading year, but uh, they're always one year behind, so the information coming in wouldn't be valid for last year. It would be valid for two years ago. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Pat. No, but I'm thinking it's the identification of the individual rather than that. One of the problems is how do we identify people who have fallen through the net? That's the, that, that was more the, more the point. Sorry. Um, Malaysia. Sure. Malaysia. Chair. Yep. Uh, Melissa. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. Uh, I've always felt uh, one of the weaknesses within the system is that there isn't a designated portal, you know, uh, for those types of uh, queries. That uh, very often, if you're um, um, if you're tempted to map it to uh, the, the generic numbers or the likes of it, then you don't really know who's who's dealing with it or. Or, or to what extent it is that that person who had even received the query would have the authority uh, or the ability to deal with it. Uh, but that if there was this portal that, that was there specifically for that reason, uh, then I think that would be a big help as well too. Okay, thank you. Okay, if we're to move on to the next item of the agenda, uh, Department of Finance, Statutory Drill 2020-332. I uh, ask members to note the holding response from the department on page 193. Second time I bring it up. And, uh, and the, uh, regarding 2020 332, 
and the committee suggestion to extend the restriction to the forfeiture for the, the restriction of the forfeiture for the first quarter of 21-22. Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. Uh, Department of Finance 2021 20, January monitoring round second phase. Draw members' attention to a response from the Department of Finance at page 195 regarding the repayment of rates released by supermarkets. And informing the committee of the 1.7 million uh, repayment by BNQ, and also providing an explanation in relation to of, to officials uh, accepting incomplete monitoring round information. Do we have any comments? Uh, well, go, go ahead. It's disappointing. The others haven't responded in the same way that BNQ has. Yep. Uh, I just want to know, if members, if we'd like to wish to ask the department for a list of transaction types that do not require. Oh, sorry, this is the second part of it. Um, if we ask, it, ask the department for a list of transaction types that do not require completion of the forms relating to this monitoring round, because I think that's the second part of the issue we were trying to deal with. Are we content? Content. Uh, moving on to the Department of Finance at January monitoring bids. Uh, Ask members to note a response from the Department of page 199 in respect of the January monitoring details. Are we content? Agreed? Agreed. Uh, Minister for Infrastructure Committee January monitoring round briefing. Uh, ask members to note a response from the Minister for Infrastructure at page 228 regarding January monitoring uh, briefing to the Committee for the Infrastructure. Are we content? Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. Uh, Department of Finance uh, Procurement Board Terms of Reference. Uh, ask members to note a response from the Department of Finance at page 332, which includes a copy of the Terms of Reference for the Procurement Board and includes the membership. It is understood the Board met recently and an update will be provided by the Department shortly. Are we agreed? Agreed. Uh, no. A note from the clerk to the House of Lords EU Select Committee, Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. Ask members to note a response from the clerk to the House of Lords Select Committee at page 237 regarding issues relating to the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol. This indicates that in a few weeks' time, information may be available on VAT, hmm. the Arbitration Panel, and the P Partnership Council. Hmm. The clerk is in the process of commissioning with the Clark for the TEO external research on these matters. Are we agreed? Great. Committee for the Executive Office Terms of Reference Committee for EU Exit to note correspondence received for the Committee for the TEO at page 240 regarding a copy of the Terms of Reference for the Executive Committee dealing with EU Exit matters. Are we content? Agreed? Great. Committee for the Executive Office Joint Consultative Working Group <coughs> to note the correspondence received from the Committee for the TEO page 249, indicating that the junior ministers have undertaken to provide further information on the joint consultative working group. The uh, clerk for the TEO is also seeking information on the shared prosperity fund. Are we agreed? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a... Five may, pardon me, Chair, if I may, I mean, something we might all be agreed on is that there's a, you know, TEO, I think, in terms of some of the um, protocol structures and to, you know, it would be helpful if they were to make a statement to the assembly at some point. Be good. I would love somebody to make a statement anywhere about the alphabet soup of the protocol and the various committee structures and who's in them and where they're in them and when they're going to appear and their terms of reference. I would thoroughly echo that. Uh, I would like any sort of education on that particular issue. Uh, at least somebody who I can sort of write sort of letters to. But noted. Are we agreed? Uh, sort of next item on the agenda, ARC 21 Green Growth, uh, to consider correspondence received from the Acting Chief Executive in ARC 21, page 252, of a copy of a letter sent to Executive Ministers regarding recycling and green growth. Uh, you will be aware of my declaration of interest at the beginning of this meeting. And ask members if they wish to ask the Department for Finance for a copy of the response sent to ARC 21. Any commentary? Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Okay. Uh, composite request. Draw members' attention to the composite request at page 255. Uh, composite information for request. Oh, is this agreed? Agreed. agreed. 
Okay, forward work program. Forward work program is page 260. Advise members the following oral briefings relating to the public sector reform have been rescheduled. Institute of Government, the 24th of, 24th of March. Pivotal on the 14th of April. NIPS on the 21st of April. And the Constructions Employers Federation briefing on the PAC report and the capital projects is now scheduled for the 20th of April. Are we content with these? Say agreed. Agreed. Advise members that the NIC Act 2 briefing by the Nevin Economic Research Institute will brief in the draft budget on the 17th of uh, February. The Department has indicated that its planned SSE and budget briefings are now running a week later than expected into correspondence. Thus, the decision on accelerated passage for the budget bill will be sought on the 24th of February. Is the committee content with these changes? Are we agreed? Agreed. Uh, the committee is content with the draft forward work programme, so it's agreed. 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 Please. Any other business? None has been notified. Chair, today. may I raise something? Sorry. Yep, sorry. 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 I'll let you in a second. Just, I was going to propose, maybe I should have done under correspondence, there's something in the draft budget document, which is in page, um, it's in page 30, for everyone who's got the draft budget. Um, uh, on page 37, it is um, uh, under the Department of Finance's entry, it says DOF will continue to liaise with uh, HMT, the banking sector, uh, and other financial services providers um, uh, on EU exit, basically. And we haven't had a statement on the implications of EU exit for our banking sector, yeah, um, but they are pretty significant. It's not covered by the protocol, and we know that Bank of Ireland, for example, is and Ulster Bank, and Ulster Bank, Bank are both looking at their operations. I think it, I would like to make a representation that the committee writes to the department to get a an update on what this means effectively and what work streams there do. It may be something the economy are as well, but given that it's in the Department of Finance's budget um, subheading, I, and they specifically say they're liaising with HMT in the banking sector, it would be helpful to know who they're that, liaising with, who they're they're liaising with and what the, what the concerns are. Did they also, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't got that just in front of me. Did they mention the Bank of England as well? No. I'm sure they would, I presume they, I doubt that the DOF would link would liaise directly with the Bank of England. I assume that would be the, via HMT, but um, because they don't have any prudential rule. But, but obviously, with the potential of the implications of the protocol within the banking sector, the moves. The protocol doesn't have any implications in the banking sector. It doesn't. The protocol, has, the protocol does not cover financial services, Chair. Be absolutely clear. There is. It is zero. <laughs> I am only pulling your. Oh, I see. Okay, I, good. I am fully aware of what the <laughs> protocol, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed your extremely long Twitter stream. And I do more. I, I could do more for. I do more for. But I do think there's an, yeah. there is an issue here. We, yeah. it, so but no, I think. Right. But I think as a, to your to your substantive point, if we're content, I think that's it, that that would be acceptable. Um, also, through Pat, with your thing on banking. And your uh, one of the issues with your APG on banking as well. We might write both to the department and also to your APG on this issue as well, because one of the things that's been raised is the potential of uh, job losses, particularly within the banking sector, by this move and um, desegregation. That's on. We don't know. What unfortunately, we don't know yet because they haven't really been upfront about what they're actually doing. Either bank is no, doing. I, and I know the unions have, and the unions have been. The FSU. I make a declaration here. The unions have been in contact with me. But the issue, I think, I think that's, that is germane. If we are content, are we agreed? Great. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. Uh, uh, um, a number of these have just asked for. I don't know. I'm sure you we have those two addresses I put into the chat there. One's for the MPLA, uh, MLAs, and that's from our uh, economy minister, from herself. And it's a very that's a good contact. And the other one is land and property services for anyone which uh, has to do with LRSS cases. So I'll put those two addresses in there, and they're, they're really, that, that, that's, that, that is from the economy department and from land and property as well, all right? Okay. Okay. And finally, oh, sorry, the chair, can, I, can, can I just check through the chair? Were other people having difficulty with their connection, or is it purely <laughs> yes, my difficulty? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I have to say, Lucia, that this is a, a, an example of how badly things can go wrong when you try to hold a committee entirely over the internet. Yes. Uh, we've, yeah. had, we've had so many difficulties. You're out in the wilds of Castle Durd, but even people much closer by 
we're not hearing them or we hear them like it's almost unintelligible. So you're no different to quite a few of the folk we've had on today. Uh, sir, to all the members of the committee, may I apologise on behalf of uh, the communications links that we've had today. But it's important that the committee do have the chance to fully listen and participate in every single part of these committee proceedings. Can I, I raised at the Chair's Liaisons Group um, that particular issue, and indeed other members of the Chair's, li the Chair's Liaisons Group had similar concerns, though, uh, to be quite frank, um, the uh, Assembly staff and uh, elements of the Assembly staff, particularly the clerk, seemed to think it was a problem that was with our sort of broadcast brand connections external to the building. But no matter what it is, whatever side it is, it needs to get sorted out. And particularly when we come to doing things like scrutiny around the budget, I do not want ourselves to be in a position where none of the people cannot hear it as well. You will also be, uh, and again, this is a advice I've given to members of my party. You may choose to uh, follow it or not within your own parties or whatever your own particular rules are. But I've been asked where they haven't heard particular parts of the uh, evidence whether they would uh, agree to the minutes being passed or not. And I think it's important, particularly when we're looking at legislation, if we haven't heard the evidence, we need to make that, we need to make that clear, because it's not right that members of a legislative body, and particularly a committee, and the committee as important as this, if you do not hear the evidence, that you're not put in a position where you said that you agreed to the minutes, because I think we need to make that clear. We've got to be able to fully understand and hear what we're doing. If we are content, okay. can I make one brief suggestion, Chair? Just on, just like, uh, given that I think for for the foreseeable we will have at least a degree of hybrid virtual proceedings. When people are giving evidence to us, I think they should be told in advance that they could, should provide like, any PowerPoint documents to the clerk or to the basically so that you, because um, that's not a criticism of um, Colin. His presentation was very useful, but it was just that. That probably didn't help his connection, nor did it help the coherence of things. So he may have to instruct the clerk there, or, or broadcasting, or you to move on a page. But I think that would be that might smooth things. Okay. Do you know what I mean? If there's a, if there's a visual presentation on a, either a PowerPoint or a yeah. whatever. Uh, right. Thank you very much, Eddie. Uh, just before I sort of announce the date of the next meeting, and we go into private session. The uh, first thing was that uh, we never really got an opportunity to thank Jim when he was uh, as the clerk because of um, you having to go and shield Jim. And just as the chair of this committee, I just wanted to say formally, while you're here, rather than yes. doing over a link or whatever here, it is, yeah. um, you know, thank you very much indeed for everything you did. Thank you very much indeed for how well you sort of steered this committee. And thank you very much indeed, particularly sort of getting a private member's bill through and what you did. Um, you know, thank you very much, and indeed, from all of behalf of the committee, I think I sort of thank you. But if, I know the deputy chair would like yeah, to say. I, I would be keen to echo those sentiments, chair. I've known Jim for a long time now, and uh, on other committees, uh, most notably, I think the Eddy Committee, as it was called in those days, and uh, he certainly struck a chord with me with regards to all the uh, electricity work he did, uh, we did in that committee. I think we produced three reports in quick succession. Uh, in a very timely way and in a very critical point in, in our history with regards to energy prices and the change in the flux within the energy uh, sector at that time. So again, I've learned over the years that Jim has been a, a network professional in his job. And I'm certainly personally sad to see him go, but I also am very glad that he's taken the decisions that he has to semi-retire because you know something, I think you, you need to go out and enjoy your life as much as you can. <laughs> and you can become uh, embroiled in a bubble, uh, uh, not less in politics or, or on the fringes of it. So, Jim, this, thank you for all the service, all the years of service, all the help you have been to me and all our commi uh, committee members, and I, I wish you all the best in the future. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank, thank you very, very much, much indeed. Thank you. Uh, uh, next committee meeting will be uh, in here on, at uh, 1400 on the 10th of February. Now we're going to go into private session. This is the